stories of the Bible are these amazing stories of how God doesn't use perfect people and doesn't use perfect pictures. He uses broken people to demonstrate who he is. Hey, good morning and later, good afternoon, New North Church. Uh, Rob Hall here, one of our pastors. It's great to be worshiping with you. I want to start with a, a serious question, but you may not get it at first. And here's the question. Are you a Christian atheist? Are you a Christian atheist? You may be going, well, wait a second, Rob. Isn't that an oxymoron? I mean, like, how can a Christian one who professes faith in God, also be an atheist, someone who does not believe that there is any type of God. Well, here's my definition. A Christian atheist is someone who believes in God, but lives like God does not exist. Someone who believes in God, they know some things about God, but then their life, their lifestyle, their thinking, all of that is, is an expression of really the fact that they don't believe in God. So they may be a Christian by lifestyle or affiliation or their parents maybe were Christians or they grew up casually attending church. But really, when you look at their life, it's no different than anyone else around them and us. Now, before you laugh or denounce this idea, I, I actually think it can happen to any one of us, honestly. See, Barna, uh, a, a, a kind of a research group, released some data recently that really kind of shocked some of us in the Christian world, especially as pastors. And they essentially said, among other things, that one in three Christians, so one in three Christians have stopped watching and participating in their church's online environments altogether. One in three. Now, now this doesn't mean that those folks have walked away from God, but man, I have deep concerns about the state of faith of people not only in our church, but in the pastors and friends' churches that I talk to all the time. I think here's the deal. COVID has honestly just made it so much easier to pretend like you have a deep and growing relationship with God or, or any relationship with God. See, you can occasionally attend church online. You can talk all about God and, and post about him on your Instagram and social media, man. You can even maybe be in a small group but something is missing, and I think for most people that something is God's presence, God himself. And so please hear me. I am not talking about you know, losing your salvation, right? I'm not talking about that. I believe that once you have real and authentic faith, I like to say you can slip and fall on the deck of the ship, but you'll never fall overboard. I'm talking about those people who believe in God, but again, live like he doesn't exist. And I say all that because we're coming into a section, the final kind of section of the book of Judges. And in chapter 17 and 18, I think this was exactly the same problem the people of God faced way, way back then. And we see it in a phrase that is repeated several times in the book of Judges. Um, in Judges chapter 17, verse 6, it says, In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. Or another translation says, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Now, I mean, again, doesn't that like really feel like our culture today where just everyone is doing right in their own eyes? Maybe as you look inside your own heart, as I look in mine, I wonder how many of us, that's true for us, that we're doing what we think is right. Christian in name, but not Christian in practice. And so what I wanna do today is just give you three warning signs, three kind of just warning signs for the dashboard of your life that you are potentially becoming a Christian atheist, okay? So if you're taking notes, this is the first one. Warning sign number one is this. Christian atheists redefine God rather than submit to him. Okay, Christian atheists, they redefine God, who he is and how he behaves, and rather than just submitting to him as he is. And so the first person we're gonna meet, remember in this, what we've called this judges cycle, or really a downward spiral, is a man named Micah. Let's look at what happens. I'm in Judges chapter 17. I'm gonna look at the first few verses. Judges chapter 17. Go ahead and turn to your Bibles at home with me, and I'll look starting in verse one. 
It says, now a man named Micah from the hill country of Ephraim said to his mother, the 1100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and about which I heard you utter a curse, I have that silver with me. I took it. Then his mother said, oh, the Lord bless you, my son. And when he returned the 1100 shekels of silver, his mother said, I solemnly, solemnly consecrate my silver to the Lord for my son to make an image overlaid with silver, and I will give it back to you. So after he returned the silver to his mother, she took 200 shekels of silver and gave it them to a silversmith who used them to make an idol, and it was put in Micah's house. Now, this man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod in some household gods and installed one of his sons as his priest. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. All right, so let's stop there. All right, so who is this guy, Micah? Okay, Micah is an absolute rascal, in my opinion. I mean, think about it. He steals a large sum of money from his poor mama. That's terrible. And the only reason why he gives it back, he suddenly grows a conscience because he hears his mom calling down a curse on whoever stole the money. Now, back then, um, people back then really considered curses to be big deals. Like today we go, whatever, we don't believe in that stuff, right? And that voodoo or whatever. Back then they did. And so he hears his mom calling down a curse. He freaks out, grows a conscience, goes back to his mom and says, mom, um, yeah, that money, yeah, um, that was me. I stole it, right? And so clearly, Micah is a man of, with very little morals, weak character, but you know, we'll see that he had some religion in him, okay? Now let's look at Micah's mom. Like, man, she seems pretty amazing at first. She forgives her son, blesses her son, says, God, please bless my son. She even then takes this money. She dedicates it all to the Lord. It's all looking good. It's all looking godly, right? Micah's mom clearly knew some things about God, right? She knew that God wants us to give generously to him, right? She prays to him. But then she does something completely shocking, something that for the original hearers, they, this, their eyes got wide open. She takes 200 pieces of silver, not all of the money. Did you notice that? Only 200 pieces of silver. And she goes down to the local silversmith and says, yo, homie, can you make a little household God for me and my family? Basically make an idol for me and my family to worship. She then takes her little idol and comes home and says, hey, Micah, put this into your homemade shrine. Man, we're gonna get our home worship on. Now we got our own little church service at home. And so Micah says, this is great. And he sets up a little shrine and burns incense and gets all his gods out. And he says, hey, son, hey, you're not doing anything. Let's make you a priest, right? And so he makes his son a priest. And at this point, right, it all looks good. It all looks so religious. It all looks so faithful and pious. But what's the problem? The problem is clearly that they are breaking the second commandment. All right, let me just read that for us today. In Exodus chapter 20, God gave these to Moses. Remember, 10 commandments, not 10 suggestions. And the second commandment is this, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on, earth, or on the earth beneath or on the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Now, I don't have time to explain all of this, but let me do some things here, like we need to stop and ask ourselves, well, what's wrong? Like, why does God prohibit us from worshiping idols? You know, things that help us. Don't those things help us honor him and worship him? But see, the problem with an image or an idol is it can never fully express all that God is, all of his character, all of his nature, all of his attributes, they can't. See, idols, especially when they're fashioned for God, can only express some small part of who God is. And so instead of submitting to God as he is, idol worship kind of tries to pick and choose the parts of God we want to worship, the parts of God that are comfortable, the parts of God that make sense to us. And so idol worship really does, at its core, try to reshape and redefine who God is. It's honestly a way that even people today try to domesticate God. And so, and that's exactly what Micah and his mom were doing. That's exactly what the nation of Israel for centuries struggled with. 
Now, you may be at home saying, well, Rob, this is great. You know, I don't have a crucifix, right? I don't have any idols around my home, and I would say good for you or whatever. But, but while we don't do this today, at least make physical idols, oh, man, we have many what I call idols of the heart. There's many ways we, and myself included, try to, to domesticate God and make sense of him. Have you ever heard someone or have you ever said things like this, things like, you know, you know, I don't believe in a God like that. Like, I don't believe in a God of wrath, a God who's jealous, a God who would like send people to hell. I don't believe in a God like that. Or people will say, I heard this all the time, like, you know, Pastor Rob, I believe in the God of the New Testament. I don't believe in the God of the Old Testament. Or the famous one today is, you know, my God is a God of love. That's it, right? And so Christian atheists, sometimes like without even knowing it, they'll redefine God instead of submitting to God as he's revealed himself to us. And, and, and this is one of the reasons why we're, I'm so excited. We are putting together an 11-week teaching series in October called None Like Him. And we're going to explore in this series the character and nature of God for 11 weeks. It starts on October 11th. And we're going to be looking at what's called God's incommunicable attributes, the ways God is not like us whatsoever. And I think it's going to be so good and so healthy for me and for our church. Let's get back to the story for Micah and his mom. See, it's like they were trying to do right, but they were doing it in the absolutely wrong way. They were calling on the name of the Lord. They were worshiping him, but they were redefining the God that they were worshiping him. And really it was all for their own selfish benefit. Right, look at it, like Micah's mom kept most of all, and actually all the money for herself because that idol was still in their home. Again, she's being dishonest. She's not putting God first. She's just trying to keep, you know, all of her options open. Micah, like it just irritates me, right, as a pastor, right? He got to just play church. He gave his son a religious job. And you maybe think, well, what's the problem with like home worship? That's what we're all doing today. But here's the problem. The shrine right? Um, God had already told them that you can't just worship wherever you want. No, the people of God were supposed to worship in a central place, either in the tabernacle, right? The movable tent of God or later the temple. God's people couldn't just worship wherever they wanted. That came much later in the New Testament and in the new covenant, right? In addition, Micah made his son a priest. What's the big deal with that? Well, he's violating another Mosaic law. Only those from the tribe of Levi could be priests. Now again, Micah and his mom were reshaping and redefining God to fit them instead of submitting God to who he is and allowing God to shape them. See, God is telling us today, he's telling me, God says, man, submit to me as I am, not as you want me to be. See, Christian atheists, man, we can look all religious on on the outside, right? But on the inside, we're just like everyone else. And like Micah and his family, we we may find ourselves submitting to a very nice, to a very comfortable God, but to a non-existent God. All right, if you're taking notes, here's warning sign number two that you're becoming a Christian atheist. Warning sign number two is Christian atheists use God rather than worship him. Christian atheists use God rather than worship him. Look with me at a, the next person of our story is a man named Jonathan. This was a priest. And uh, look with me at verse seven, a young Levite from Bethlehem in Judah who had been living within the clan of Judah left that town in search of some other place to stay. On his way, he came to Micah's house in the hill country of Ephraim, and Micah asked him, hey, where are you from? I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah. He said, I'm looking for a place to stay. And then Micah said, awesome, live with me and be my father and, 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 and priest, and I'll give you 10 shekels of silver a year and your clothes and your food. So the Levite said, awesome, and agreed to live with him, and the young man became like one of his sons to him. Then Micah installed the Levite and the young man became his priest and lived in his house. And Micah said, now I know that the Lord will be good to me since this Levite has become my priest. All right. So here's the man named Jonathan and he leaves 
his tribe and he leaves Bethlehem to go look from, for work. I really am not clear on why he left his tribe or Bethlehem, but it becomes clear in a second. And so Micah, or excuse me, Jonathan's out and about and, and he bumps into Micah and, and, and Micah's thrilled. He's like, wait, you're a priest? Awesome, I got this little home church. I got this little shrine. My son's not doing a very great job of being a priest. You come be my priest. Man, I'll give you a clothing allowance, right? Man, I'll, I'll feed your food, man. You'll be like a son to me. And the priest is like, this is my lucky day. This is awesome. And so it looks like in some ways, Micah's kind of doing right for a change, right? He hires a, a legitimate priest, but it's all a farce. It's all for show. It's all fake, and we'll see that in a moment. Let me just summarize the next chapter. In Judges 18, right, uh, the tribe called Dan, or the Danites, they come along. They're one of the 12 tribes of Israel, and even though they had already been given an allotment of land, what Joshua called an inheritance, they actually failed to possess the inheritance, I think, because they were spiritually lazy. They weren't obeying God, and so like Jonathan, they're roaming around looking for a place to settle down for an, entire, uh, for an entire tribe. They find this city, city called Laish, and they're like, oh man, we're gonna, we're gonna take that town. We like it. You know, they make good food there. We like the women there, et cetera, et cetera. But then on this journey, they meet Micah, and they go, whoa, dude, you got an awesome little home church set up. We love your idols. And oh, wow, Jonathan, you got a, your own personal priest. That's amazing. So they say, hey, Jonathan, we're gonna go destroy the city. Bless us. Right, You have that personal connection with God, your priest, so pray for us and bless us. And Jonathan prays, and, and Jonathan says, yeah, God's gonna bless you. And the Dan- Danites go, awesome. They go out, they destroy the city of Laish, and, and they overtake it. They, you know, they say, this is now the city of Dan. This is our place. They begin to settle down. But well, meanwhile, a few of the soldiers go back to Micah, and they go, yo, man, um, you know that little shrine? Yeah, we like that silver. We're gonna take it all. And, and Jonathan, the priest, is like, whoa, guys, you can't do that. Like, this is like my little home church. What are you doing? And the Danites go, wait a second, Jonathan. Like, like, like why don't you come serve us? Why don't you come be our priest? Like, forget this little, little nobody and his family. Come, like, be a priest for the entire tribe of Dan. And Jonathan goes, wow, that's great. Yeah, that sounds good. So he dumps Micah and his family. Remember, he was a son to them, but he dumps them and goes on to something better, something bigger, right? Jonathan's like, man, I I love a promotion. Why not? Let's get out of here. Let's move. Now, at this point, I'm feeling a little sorry for Micah, but not a whole lot, right? He's merely reaping what he's sown, right? He's getting a taste of his own medicine. And, uh, and honestly, Jonathan, this entire week has put a bad taste in my mouth, right? As a pastor, he was a priest, right? As soon as like a better offer came, Jonathan was gone. He was a ghost, right? He was using God for his own career advance, advancement. And even the tribe of Dan, the Danites, man, they're kind of, honestly, I hate to be this crass, but they're like one of the sorriest tribes of all of Israel at the time. I mean, think about it. These were like the people of God, one of the 12 tribes, and they really were viewing God as like this cosmic genie, just rubbing the lamp, the genie God pops out, and they're saying, oh, okay, we get three requests. Well, we want the city of Leash, and we'll take Jonathan as our priest. No, they only wanted what God could give them, not God himself. And believe it or not, you could be fully out of God's will and it could seem like God is blessing you. That's exactly what happens to the Danites. They go out, they destroy and and overthrow Laish. They take it over. Everything looks good. Everything looks successful, man. They even gave praise to God, but it was all lip service. Look closely with me at Judges 18, verse 31. Judges 18, verse 31 says, they continued to use the idol Micah had made all the time the house of God was in Shiloh. So here they are worshiping an idol Micah had made, giving praise and glory to God, thanking God that blessed them. But the commentator tells us the whole time the house of God, God's presence was miles away in Shiloh. It's unbelievable. See, the Danites, just like Micah, just like his mom, just like Jonathan, were not worshiping God. They were using him. They were pious on the outside but, and doing all this stuff for God. And, and, the, and the commentator says God is not even there. He's miles away in Shiloh. See, again, 
They had the right God, but the wrong worship. They had the right God, but the wrong motivation. They had the right God, but they were doing things for themselves. Now, I know I'm probably not preaching to anyone. I know this doesn't relate to any of you watching, but let me just talk about myself. Have you ever used God in this way? Right? Have you ever prayed hard for something? God finally answers your prayer. And, original, and, and at the moment, you're so thankful, you're so grateful, you're maybe even a little impressed with your own faith. But then months go by and you find yourself walking away from God, far away from him, and you're wondering how you even got there. You were using God for what he could give you, not for God himself. Or maybe in this pandemic, if we're honest, right? I hope you're honest. You're saying things, you're doing things that you swear you'd never say and things you, you swear you'd never do. And deep down in your heart, man, if, if you really in that place between just you and the Lord, you realize, man, it's been all about you all along. Well, let's look at warning sign number three, my last warning here from this text. And here it is. Christian atheists believe in God, but they don't actually know God. Christian atheists believe in God, but they don't actually know God. Let's look at Micah again, right? His sin was clearly idolatry. He made, it, he made a do-it-yourself religion. You know, um, it, wasn't about, it wasn't a religion based on God's word. It was based on what made him comfortable. It was a religion based on comfort, not obedience. See, Micah clearly believed in God, but he didn't really know him. Well, what about Micah's mom? Man, she said and did some good things, right? She forgives her son. She asks for God's blessing. She offers some of the money to the Lord. She finances her son's like spiritual aspirations, right? But it was all for her own selfish benefit. She kept most of the money for herself. She violated the second commandment. She believed in God, but lived as if he didn't exist. Well, what about Jonathan the priest? Now, now hear me, please. Like, there is nothing wrong in um, trying to better your own situation. Nothing wrong with that. But Jonathan clearly was not serving God. He was serving himself. Man, he was open and ready to work for the highest bidder, right? Um, He left Bethlehem. We don't know why. He served Micah. A better job opportunity came, and and he goes to the Danites. Man, he was clearly about himself. See, Jonathan, even as a priest, believed in God, but didn't serve him. And finally, what about the Danites? They look pretty promising, right? But no, instead of doing what God had, and, and, and Joshua had told them to do years earlier and taking their inheritance, taking their land, they chose the easier way. For whatever reasons, they did not take and possess the land that was given to them. I think they were spiritually lazy. I think they were clearly disobedient. They wanted God on their own terms and see They believed in God, but lived as if he didn't exist. Now, I think, especially in this pandemic, especially because all that's going on in our world today, man, we can easily, too, fall into this trap. See, Christians are really good at collecting all types of knowledge and all types of information. You know, you can have a PhD in theology and religion and your heart be far from God. Did you know that? See, real faith, authentic faith is what you do with that knowledge, right? Real faith is actually the thing that triggers action. See, for Christians, this is a life shaped around knowing Jesus and walking with Jesus and trusting him and obeying him even when it gets hard and difficult. And so here's my big idea. Here's my idea of this entire sermon in one tweetable sentence for you. Believing in God is not the same as knowing God. Believing in God is not the same as knowing God. And so I just want to ask, as you look at your own life, wherever you're at this morning, today, as you look at the kind of what I call the dashboard of your life, are any of these warning signs blinking maybe yellow? Then are any of them kind of turned red yet? Like which of these three warning signs really resonate with you right now? Are you redefining God rather than submitting to him? Have you felt like you've been using God rather than worshiping him? Do you believe in God? But if you're really honest, 
you really don't know him? It made me think of an old quote that I'm sure I've used before preaching. It's so good. But an author, Wilbur Reese, wrote this many years ago, and he said, I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or to disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of God to make me love a black man or pick beats with a migrant. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of a womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. See, one of the beautiful things about the pandemic is many people who just want $3 worth of God are now gone from the church, right? There's no spiritual tourists any longer. But the problem is you cannot have $3 worth of God. You either trust him and worship him as he is, or you are in danger of becoming a Christian atheist. So please, church, don't settle for being a Christian atheist. Don't settle for $3 worth of God when you can have the real thing. You can have Jesus and his presence and power and the Holy Spirit in your life today. You can have freedom. You can have grace. All your shame, all your guilt has been nailed to the cross. You can now walk in the power of the Spirit today. Man, why would you say no to that kind of God today? Let's pray together. And so, Father, we just come before you again, and we bow our heads, and we bow our hearts, God, and we just confess and we repent that every single one of us, in one way or another, has become a Christian atheist, where we profess you in name, but we don't live like we truly know you. God, I pray that we would be a church who not only believes in the name of Jesus, but we will live out our faith with fear and trembling for it is God who works in us and through us. And so God, right now, not only do we confess that, God, not only do we repent of that, God, we now turn to you, God, to your freedom, to your grace, to your hope, to your forgiveness, to your joy. We say, God, we want more of you today. So right now, wherever we are at, we just say, we open up our hands and we just say more of you, Jesus, more grace and more hope and more freedom and more forgiveness and more love, God. We don't want to just believe in you. We want to know you deeply. And we pray all this in the name of the Father and the name of the Son and the name of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you.